stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness. You may find Stream on my blog at TrustPsyche.com and on my YouTube channel, Jessica Deruta. Please take what serves you and leave the rest. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream, for the what of the dream knows itself through the how. Welcome back to Stream. It's still May 20th, 2018 here, and the stream has been open for today. I'm not entirely sure what is wanting to come through in this particular stream, but I felt called to get back on after my third recording of stream where we're looking at family systems and astrology. The chart that you see up in each episode is the chart for the moment that I began the recording. So right now I just want to name that the moon is exactly rising at nine degrees Leo here in Sarasota, Florida, and it is conjunct the North Node. There's also a Mercury-Jupiter opposition in the sky, which might be part of the reason why I feel like talking so much. Uh, Mercury at almost 12 degrees Taurus and Jupiter retrograding at 16 Scorpio is on my natal Pluto. So I think there's just a lot of uh, power and um, kind of force that's wanting to come through right now. So I'm doing my best to open the mercurial channels here for that vision and maybe that Jupiterian mountaintop vision to come through. Uh, just to name a little bit more about the current transits in the sky, uh, the sun is at 29 degrees Taurus, about to move into Gemini. And it is in a nice trine to Mars, a lot of kind of activating energy. I can feel that I'm going to want to go on a nice long walk later. And uh, we also have a wide Mercury-Uranus conjunction in Taurus with Uranus just having moved into Taurus. I can really feel the difference there from that transition from Aries fire into Taurus earth and um, I'm excited to see how that continues to play out. And then I have, uh, I have, we all have uh, Venus at one degrees, Cancer opposite Saturn at eight degrees, Capricorn. So in the last episode, I gave uh, an example of a multi generational aspect pattern of Venus Saturn that I, my mother and I shared. So that's very fitting that that's in the sky. And then there's also a Mars square Uranus, and the day before I gave an example of that shared aspect pattern between my father and I. So again, when we see these archetypal um, combinations in the world transits and we have them in our own birth charts, we usually feel a, a resonance there and a calling to um, inhabit even more that particular energy. We also have this really nice exact Jupiter trine Neptune, which I've really been loving. I've just been taking a lot of swims in the ocean here in the Gulf and at the pool and just really loving meditating in the water. I'm noticing a lot of expansive thoughts in the water. In fact, stream, um, the idea for this forum was born from me swimming in the pool and it just kind of hit me and I was like, oh my gosh. And the whole thing just kind of came at once and felt like this moment of grace. And I really love that feeling of that Jupiter and Neptune, just like that expansive celebratory um, vision that can happen in the water. And of course, stream is a honoring of Neptune and honoring of the waters of 
the unconscious and the emotions and the wellspring of the imagination. It's also that honoring of the stream and flow of consciousness that comes through Neptune and particularly for me having both the sun, my sense of self and Mercury, my mind conjunct Neptune in my natal chart, um, streaming, stream of consciousness and intuition are key signatures that I'm working with this life and just really noting how I move through the world, which is a way that is more um, about intuition and flow. It's not quite as linear, although I can be that way because I have a strong Saturn and a lot of Capricorn energy. I mean, I really can get down to business and be super organized. Um, you know, I love to work. I love structure. But I, I notice that as far as, you know, my creativity and my flow state is definitely one that is very much about just a an intuition and it really feels like just kind of floating down the stream you know merrily 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 life is but a dream and that really feels true to me I feel deep down that we were all dreamed into existence by the divine and our souls were dreamed into existence by the divine and that that shared origin for us all transcends not only our individuality but our egoic state of consciousness that we often find ourselves in you know on a daily basis and in this modern world and I love those moments where we can get back down 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 into our roots or our original state that is the ground of being and I believe that astrology is one amazing tool, perspective, way of being to both help us remember the ground of being that we all come from and share and it helps bring awareness and empowerment to our individual senses of self in navigating being human and having personalities and having an individual sense of self in this world. So what I love about astrology is that it both shows us our individual nature and our collective or transcendent nature. Let's see what wants to come through here. So I want to go back into something that I mentioned in the last episode of Stream, which is structural poetics. I really love structural poetics, and I also love this idea of a systems view of astrology. Um, so a lot of people are going to be familiar with systems theory, um, which, in a nutshell, is a transdisciplinary study of the organization of phenomena, and independent of their substance type or spatial or temporal scale of existence. So it investigates both the principles common to all complex entities and the models which can be used to describe them. So systems theory can be applied to everything. It can be applied to um, ecology, ecosystems. It can be applied to family systems, like I talked about in the last episode, and therapy, psychology, social work, um, you name it, it can be applied. So I, I like applying systems theory to astrology and I call it a systems view of the chart. So 
astrology demonstrates an inextricable web of meaning grounded in harmonic patterns of nature and the cosmos. Therefore, it seems ethically imperative to the gift of sight and revelation that astrology affords us in tracking the unfoldment of life through time. To apply and see the workings of astrology from this interconnected web. So we have, we know that we are interconnected as human beings, as a species, sharing this ecosystem of planet Earth, we're becoming increasingly more a planetary being, a global civilization, with heightened awareness of one another, of other cultures, of other peoples, of other religions, of other perspectives, and more and more we're recognizing how interdependent we all are. And whether that interdependency is that interdependency within our family, within our tribe, with at work, um, within a nation, or as a whole planetary being. And of course, ecologically, as we're all very intensely and dramatically having to wake up to the fact that we share this planet and the resources on this planet. So a systems view allows us to not only see the chart as a holistic and integral whole, but the multi-dimensional events of our individual and collective lives. So how we might begin to understand and integrate a systems view of astrology into our practice and the way we make interpretations. And this is really important for me, that the way we make our interpretations as astrologers, as storytellers, must come from this systems view perspective as much as possible. Because for me, astrologers are equal part phenomenologists and poets. Uh, human beings are naturally storytellers. We all carry the archetype of the storyteller. We all tell stories, whether that's the story of who we are, where we come from. We all tell stories in our personal lives, but we also all tell stories in our professional lives. You know, the storyteller has an infinite way of languaging the story and creating the narration, whether that's through math, if you're an engineer, whether that's through geometry, if you're an architect, whether that's through mythology, if you're a fiction writer. Right? We all tell stories. We're all storytellers. A human being carries the archetype of storyteller. And astrologers, in particular, really carry the archetype of the storyteller. When we give a reading or we make meaningful connections out of the living symbols that we're seeing in astrology, we are telling a story. When I give a reading, I'm doing my best to tell that person's story back to themselves in a way that is going to make them feel seen, valued, and empowered to live the story of their life with more heart, with more courage with more conviction. And so my job is not only to tell the story of the planets, of the archetypes seen in those planets, but to form a web of meaning with the way that those planets aspect one another that coherently comes across and touches that person's life in the way that that touching of that person from my soul to their soul, from the planets to them, from the divine to them, is one that feels as most healing and liberating 
and empowering as I possibly can. And so some ways that I hold a systems view of astrology is not only understanding the multidimensional ways and the multivalent ways the archetypes come through. But really holding in my being as much as possible the co-determining factors that go into making that person the unique individual that they are. And for me, it's, it's about going beyond the co-determining factors, right? So co-determining factors are, you know, what's the gender? Is there a sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, religious or spiritual practices? What country do they live in? What culture are they a part of, right? These are all the factors that go in to telling the story in a way that's going to be most relevant and meaningful for that person, Right? Because we can look at a snapshot of the heavens at any moment and we have no idea if that interpretation is for a person, a dog, a nation. Is it a birth chart? Is it a death chart? Or are we talking at the level of world transits? Or are we talking at the level of personal transits? Right. So the way that we best tell the story, the one that has the deepest connection to the subject that is correlating to that particular snapshot of the heavens is to get to know the subjectivity of that being or beings. And we orient ourselves by beginning to hear, let's say if we're talking about a person, their biography. What was their family like? What was their childhood like? Where did they grow up? But then we can bring in other things to help nuance and bring in a greater depth of understanding of that being's particular situatedness. in the fabric of life. So we can look at, for example, birth order. Are they the oldest? Are they the middle? Are they the youngest? Are they the only? Because psychologically we know that birth order is very influential in the way that somebody participates in life and therefore with their birth chart and the unique archetypal configurations of their birth chart, right? So the soul is always participating through and with the archetypal configuration seen in the birth chart. And so we're looking at the sacred union of the soul and the chart. And the chart in its blueprint has all these potentialities, but those potentialities only become real and grounded and anchored in reality because of the soul coming through. And so we want to be, get to have a better sense of the soul itself. And we want to be able to have a better sense of the environment that is constituting, influencing how that soul is showing up in this life. And we have to take into account in our interpretations as storytellers many as many factors as we can. And so it's helpful for us to not only look at all the, you know, traditional co-determining factors that I mentioned, but also to look at things like birth order, neurodiversity, right? Neurodiversity, is this person have a history of depression? Do they have a history of anxiety? 
have they been diagnosed as bipolar? Have they been diagnosed with narcissistic personality, paranoid personality, schizophrenia? Right? So we have to take into account the neurodiversity in our interpretations because how I'm going to interpret a Jupiter-Uranus transit for someone who's bipolar versus someone who has depression is going to be very different. We also want to look at the degree of marginalization by the dominant culture. So because in America we live in a cis-gendered culture, like white males who are heterosexual, and it's a bonus if you're Christian, and it's a super bonus if you're wealthy, are considered still to be the norm and in a way the goal of uh, achievement, health, and well-being. So the degree of marginalization by the dominant culture here is that if you are a black woman who identifies as lesbian and are poor, then your experience of, let's say, a Saturn transit or even just a natal placement of Saturn in your chart is going to be very different, very, very different than a white, heterosexual, wealthy man. It's not helpful to the black lesbian woman who is poor for me to interpret her chart in the same way that I would interpret a white male. Because our culture in America and our government and resources is set up to support that white man. Whereas it's set up for her to fail. And that doesn't mean he's going to be successful and she's going to fail, but I need to take into consideration the forces that are at play on a systemic level in the most mundane of terms as far as like, does she have access to food, shelter, clean drinking water, um, you know, a safe living environment and um, resources for support? Now, she might be absolutely thriving and enjoy, and the white man might be absolutely suffering from depression. So I don't want to reduce it to that the degree of marginalization somehow determines the, the um, like emotional quality of that person's being, but I do need to take it into account as far as the way that they're going to be uh, relationally set up to engage in the different archetypal qualities. I mean, we can even make it a little bit more simple. I mean, that's, that's an extreme example. And I gave that very contrasting example on a level just to really draw our awareness to it. But like, I've said this before, but like a man that has Sun Pluto versus a woman that has Sun Pluto is going to show up very differently. I mean, first of all, because the Sun archetype does relate to uh, male figures in our life and figures in our life who carry a strong um, either masculine energy or a strong energy of the archetype of self. And so if you're a woman who has that versus a man who has that, the way that that son Pluto kind of powerful male, powerful masculine, powerful sense of self energy shows up could either be, you know, as you yourself inhabiting that archetype or people in your life more so inhabiting that archetype. And we see a lot with some Pluto that you can be the empowered, powerful person, you know, strong in your sexuality, um, strong in your ability to influence change around you, carrying a powerful force of nature and ambition in your being. We can equally see that that person who has Sun Pluto shows up where the Pluto is repressing the solar 
individual and solar creativity and that that power is being occupied by the father or the husband or um, the boss or you know the same can be true it's not that a man would have one and the woman would have the other both can have both these experiences of either being the son pluto or having other people in the life in one's life hold the powerful part of son pluto right but that our society in the western world much more favors a man carrying the son pluto energy of the powerful hero than a woman carrying the energy of the powerful heroine and even though women are gaining more power across the board, there is still a deep ingrained misogyny of a powerful woman being bossy, being too dominant, being too fiery, being too forward, being too direct, being too, 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 T-O-O-O-O all the way. Whereas the man is not only encouraged to occupy that powerful place, that powerful libidinal, sexual, you know, even at times aggressive, direct place, ambitious, but the system is set up. So not only is that value bull for a man to be that way, but the system is set up to condition the man to be that way. And so when our inhabiting certain planetary archetypes comes into dissonance or disagreement with the dominant culture that we live in, we're going to have a very different experience of that archetypal quality in our being than if we were to be born into a culture where there was a profound valuing of the way that we are and the way that the culture is. So in that sense, we also have to take into consideration the historical cultural time period that we're born into and the values of that culture and the ways that that either aligns or doesn't align with the way that we show up in any particular life. So at one point, a Sun-Neptune person might be highly revered as a mystic, as a channel, as a healer, and in another time or another culture is seen as delusional, psychotic, out of touch. Then we also have to look at trauma and trauma resilience, right? We can have the same chart, two different people. They both could maybe have experienced similar trauma. Let's call it, you know, at the age of five, let's just say both of their moms died. One person's response to that trauma might be very catastrophic in that there's difficulty for the, that person to develop and function in a way that is considered high functioning, keeping a job, having good relationships, being able to feed and shelter oneself. And another person, so that person would be trauma resilient, and another person might not have that same resilience for a whole host of reasons and respond to that trauma very differently, become an addict, get addicted to heroin or pain pills, never really hold down a job, never be able to get into a relationship. So we have to look at trauma and trauma resilience. And then, you know, so things I've mentioned before, looking at the synastry with the parents and the family of origin is really important. But something I particularly like that I feel like it doesn't really get mentioned too much is the death and rebirth of the psyche through the chart. So when we go through a psycho-spiritual death and rebirth, whether that is through using um, different uh, ancient practices, meditation, yoga, or whether it's through using medicine and ritual, psychedelics, or having someone close to us die, or giving birth, whatever it might be that 
activates that second spiritual death and rebirth. When we go through that, our chart also goes through that. So even though our birth chart always stays the same over the course of a life, the way that we relate to that chart and the way that we participate through that chart can go through a death and rebirth. And so the way that we interact with the planetary archetypes changes. And the chart itself doesn't necessarily show us that. The chart doesn't necessarily, um, in a causal correlative way, say whether or not we're going to go through a death and rebirth or have trauma resilience or neuro, what our neurodiversity is or the degree of marginalization by the dominant culture. The chart cannot tell us that. But what we can do is we can see the story of the subject correlative to the chart. And then we can begin to understand how that particular chart relates to those different factors. And this was really, really, really important to me. And I feel like most astrologers aren't really there yet as far as understanding that. I mean, if you read a lot of the cookbooks or you hear people talk about um, different combinations, we often hear, well, this combination usually relates to this. And the truth of the matter is, is that's not really true. Every combination can relate to any set of co-determining factors, and it's part of what makes creation so brilliant and fascinating, is that creation itself is multidimensional and multivalent to the point that there aren't any um, guaranteed one-to-one -one correlates or you see this signature more commonly in an athlete than not. It's not actually true. It's actually much more interesting than that. If Mars re relates to athleticism, and we do a study and we see actually no, Mars isn't seen more as a sun Mars or Mars rising in an athlete than a not athlete. That doesn't mean that astrology doesn't work because it's not statistically predictive in that way it's a much more interesting story in that for example michael jordan who had mars neptune which you wouldn't really guess that he had mars neptune but he had mars neptune so the way that his mars athleticism showed up was in a Neptunian way, which was he was super flowy and seamless in his movement. And it's almost like he had a psychic reading of the field that was a linear and that he knew he could intuit where things, how and where things were going to happen, where the ball was going to go, what the move was going to be. And he would shoot those shots and they would just roll off the tip of his finger and into the basket without hitting any net you know or he could shoot almost with his eyes closed it's like that is neptune informing the way that his mars showed up and so it's much more interesting to look at it that instead of being like well you know a lot of athletes have sun mars bullshit that's not true <laughs> some do and that's great so my point is, is that we can apply that analogy to every single profession, to every single personality type. Just because you have Sun Mars doesn't mean you're an extrovert. There are plenty of people who are Sun Mars who are introverted. Sun Mars doesn't make you outgoing. But if we understand, oh, you're an introvert and you have Sun Mars, yeah, of course, that's going to show up differently than if you're an extrovert who has Sun Mars. And the reason why that's more interesting is because not only is that more accurate to the way that it works, but that when we go to tell that story, especially when we're doing counseling astrology and telling that story to that person, it's going to be much more relevant and impactful to that person's life. And they're going to hear more of themselves in the story. And the more a person can hear themselves in the story, the more they come to life, the more animated a person becomes. When we 
resonate with something, when we see ourselves in something, we become alive. We become enlivened. And that makes us want to live more. That makes us want to participate more. And that is what our job is as storytellers, especially in the context of counseling astrologers. So that's part of what I mean by bringing in a systems view of astrology. Um, and at some point on stream, I want to give an example of how to do um, astrological interpretation with our own charts. I want to do an example of like, what does it actually look like when I sit down to look at my own chart and transits on any given day and just take you step by step by, you know, how that happens. Because if I'm not going to someone else to help me remember who I am, where I come from and where I'm going, and I am doing that for myself, it's really important how I do that because the way that I'm telling my story back to myself is deeply influencing the way that I behave and the way that I act and the way that I show up in the world. I'm wondering now if part of Uranus moving into Taurus in that earth energy is to ground the insights. I'm really feeling this call toward grounding and embodying the practical side of the insights. Like it's one thing to have the intellectual insight and the awareness, which is often very stimulating and exciting, but then how do we actually ground it in our being and our body in the earth and physical form? And that's so much what Taurus is about is physicality physicality, sensation, sensate. Hmm. So thank you for going on this journey with me and exploring a little bit more in the systems view of astrology. Going into those examples, I hope begins to stretch your imagination a little bit more and holding the complexities of being human and holding the complexities of the astrological correlates to the phenomena that's happening in all of our lives. Please feel free to like the video, leave a friendly comment, share with friends and family. This is Stream and I'm Jessica Deruta. Mm.